A call to arms three years after negotiating a landmark peace accord, a former rebel commander announces a new war in Colombia. Is the country's fragile peace deal at risk of unraveling? Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. In 2016, former Colombian President Juan Manuel Santos helped broker an end to the decades-long conflict in his country that had claimed the lives of more than 200,000 people. Millions more were displaced. Santos was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize for his efforts. But last month, a faction of the FARC guerrilla movement announced its returning to the fight, accusing the government of failing to live up to its promises. When we signed the Havana Agreement, we did it with the conviction that it was possible to change the lives of the humble and the dispossessed. But the state has not fulfilled even the most important of its obligations, which is to guarantee the lives of its citizens and, in particular, to prevent their murder for political reasons. The government, meanwhile, is downplaying the rebellion and has vowed to find and arrest members of the rebel group. Well, to talk about Colombia's fragile peace deal, let's bring in our panel. Raul Gallegos joins us from Colombia's capital, Bogota. He's director for Control Risks Global Risk Analysis. Joining us from Chicago, Gloria Lariva is the U.S. coordinator of the Cuba and Venezuela Solidarity Committee. With us here in the studio in Washington, Lisa Hogard is executive director of the Latin America Working Group. And also joining us from Bogota, Michelle Begay is CGTN America's Colombia correspondent. Welcome to all of you to the show. And Michelle, let me start with you. Uh, what are the risks of this peace deal unraveling and the country falling back into a guerrilla war? Uh, I mean, how much of a threat does this breakaway group pose? I think from a journalist's perspective and, and speaking to the people on the ground, um, these situations are bumps on the road when you're trying to uh, construct peace after decades of war. And the feeling is from the international communities who are monitoring here that we've spoken to is that these this negative uh, 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 situations draw attention again to firm up commitment for peace, that the government needs to do do things uh, uh, to secure peace in the regions. And we're talking about uh, political security, uh, ed education in the region, health, uh, follow-up in the implementation, which, which costs money, which also, uh, uh, also uh, you need morale. Uh, you need uh, support for, for all of the institutions that are involved in creating peace in the region. So this, uh, uh, from speaking to international organizations here, is more of a call to attention that, that peace is fragile, that, needs to, uh, that there needs to be more support for it. But at the same time, uh, a lot of people are calling the attention that this is an armed group that we don't know how many people uh, have joined, but armed groups have been existing still, even after the peace was signed, for, for all these past three years. Narco-trafficking groups, right-winged uh, paramilitary groups. Uh, there is still a critical situation of security here in the country. And uh, seeing this group now add, uh, add if you could say, fire, uh, is, is really a cause for concern, but there are other critical issues at, at play. Gloria, what is your view on why there is now such a big question mark over the peace process? Uh, and why, what are FARC's grievances, well, this particular group, this faction of FARC, what are their grievances? I believe that there was a big question mark over the peace agreement from the time that Ivan Duque became president. He has stated when he was running uh, in his campaign and when he became elected that he wanted to virtually abrogate the peace agreement and he has moved with growing uh, hostility to the peace accord. In addition, we must note that 700 social movement activists and 137 former FARC guerrillas have been murdered by paramilitaries by the terrorism that still exists in Colombia and the government has not spoken out against this. In fact, now we see that there have been attacks and killings of some of the people who have called uh, back to arms. I believe that what is interesting about the new FARC uh, split that is now calling for arms, 
they said this time that they are not engaging in kidnapping or in targeting the police or the military, that they're targeting the policies of the oligarchy. And I think they're attempting to have a, a broader approach. But I think that the peace agreement must still be defended and to demand the implementation, the right. true implementation of all that's been uh, needed. Raul Gergos, uh, how deeply committed is the government to this peace agreement? Because if you look at some of the numbers here, uh, FARC has accused, this particular faction of FARC has accused the Colombian government of failing to implement parts of that peace deal, according to a study done by Notre Dame University here in the United States. Only a third of the agreement's provisions have been implemented. So to what extent does uh, the responsibility now fall on the government to make sure that these uh, provisions are implemented? I think there's a dual responsibility, certainly. I don't think the government is the only uh, entity responsible for, you know, adhering to the agreement. However, I think for perspective, it's important to understand that, you know, peace agreements typically are, you know, take over, you know, a decade to sort of un or unravel and bring about uh, the elements that were agreed to. In this case, we're talking about 14 to 15 year process. So obviously there are expected to be stumbling blocks along the way. Um, and, uh, but that doesn't mean that the whole agreement is about to unravel. That's one point. The other point is, yes, this is a government that was elected precisely because more than half of the population believes that this agreement has very deeply flawed elements. And one of the elements that a lot of you know, people that voted for this government seem to uh, seem to agree with is that uh, you cannot judge, for instance, or I mean, that's certainly the thinking that you cannot judge the military under the same terms as you're judging uh, members of the uh, of these armed groups, particularly because some of these armed groups, while they have a, a you know, an important ideological component, um, they are also groups that have been benefiting from illegal uh, illegal activities such as drug trafficking and illegal mining. Uh, and that, in the eyes of, you know, an important segment of the population, takes away the credibility of these people as, you know, reliable political actors and puts them in the category of more criminals. Um, and so I think that this is a government that has been elected precisely to try to fight very hard against those um, armed groups that are still operating, and there's a number of them still operating. That's why, you know, the issue of peace is obviously, yeah. you know, that the terminology is tricky because there's really no peace. I mean, there's still an armed struggle going on here. Um, and so, you know, and, and also the issue of land redistribution, that is an issue that, you know, um, is likely not going to be uh, laid out or not going to evolve the way the, the agreement lays it out. Um, but particularly the idea that some of these folks should pay prison time, especially if they are violating laws after the yeah. agreement was signed, which is what a lot of people uh, argue happened with the case of Santrich, for instance. So right. just to sum it up, this is a government that is not fully committed to pushing it uh, unchanged. All right, let's bring it to the studio. Lisa, how serious is the situation in Colombia? Are we seeing something of a blame game being played here? It, it's a bump in the road. I, I think it, all peace agreements are difficult. It is a serious wake-up call. And it's a wake-up call, really, to the government and the international community to get moving with this peace accord and fully implement it. It is a problem that the Duque government is not fully committed to the terms of the agreement that was signed and is uh, sort of seeking to criticize it, unravel it, not, not implement it fully. That matters for the ex-combatants. The, uh, the, uh, the government has a responsibility to fulfill the terms of the accords toward, to reintegrate ex-combatants. And it also matters to the many victims of the conflict who also. Right. Talking about uh, international involvement, uh, there has not been a single word of support for the peace agreement from the United States administration here in Washington. The United States, after all, is one of the three countries that brokered this deal. Exactly. The U.S. government wisely helped the Colombian government and FARC guerrillas reach the accord. Um, and that uh, is, is beneficial to long-term stability in the region. It's a shame that we aren't hearing strong words from the U.S. government. Um, but technically, the U.S. government still does support the peace accords. Michelle, uh, we have heard from the uh, former FARC leader, Rodrigo Londoño, and this is what he had to say on the latest turn of events. Let's listen to this.
I feel ashamed and I ask for forgiveness from the Colombian people, the international community, countries like Cuba and Norway that have supported us so much in this process. But I also send a message of optimism. The great majority of us are here, and modesty aside, the best of us are here. So, Michelle, I should just clarify that uh, Londonio is uh, part of the faction that is still abiding by the peace settlement. But uh, listening to what he said there, how deep uh, and significant is the split in the FARC? There is, the, the, the people who, are, who split from um, Londoño and, and the FARC members who are continuing their political uh, uh, fight and not in arms uh, are people who were important. Ivan Marquez, El Paisa, eh, these, were, these were leaders who uh, worked in, in, in the military part of, or the armed struggle, and then went into uh, the peace negotiations. So you could say that they are key figures, but something interesting to note is they've been they've they've been out of the public uh, uh, limelight for the past year. It, uh, it was last year that they stopped showing up to uh, the, uh, any judicial callings uh, to come tell the truth of what happened during the armed conflict. They began protesting in this way and disappeared for uh, for almost a year before this actually happened. And what we heard from international organizations that are monitoring this is that many of them feared when they did split up uh, that there would be a following, that people who are demobilizing in the regions would follow their leaders. However, they didn't see that exactly happen. Many of the people in demobilized regions are continuing their lives trying to fight the everyday, uh, uh, trying to, to form businesses, find employment, start their families. And so it's been three years since they demobilized, and many of them, it seems, at that moment decided they weren't going to uh, go with them. And now the question is, in these past couple of weeks, have we seen people uh, uh, follow these leaders and what we're getting a sense of is that not many are fleeing back to arms. They, they're staying put and trying to continue this process and Timochenko said it, President Santos said it, 90 percent of the FARC say that they are committed to this peace process and so uh, in the country for those who are in favor of peace which is uh, which is uh, or, or this peace agreement let uh, be more exact um, are trying to point that out, that there are 90% of FARC members who are in favor of this process. Gloria, we just heard Michelle Berguet there raise the issue of how many uh, of these former fighters are prepared to follow the breakaway group. And if you listen to Rodrigo Londonio there, uh, he says uh, the great majority and the best of us are here. So is this an effort on his part to downplay the significance and the size of that breakaway group? Well, I, I would like to first address what the gentleman from Colombia stated a few minutes ago, mm -hmm. where he laid the blame for and said that the criminals are the FARC or the other guerrilla forces. I have to say that the issue of drug trafficking, the narco trafficking in Colombia, the former president, Alvaro Uribe, is a well-known and was at the time that he was president engaged in narco trafficking. The U.S. government knows this. And he is one of those who was completely and still against the peace agreement. The other is that it does not take 10 years to implement these accords. That was not the basis of the negotiations. It was understood in the negotiations of several years that it would be implemented immediately. And the resources are there. This dragging out, this weakening, uh, the claim that the people of Colombia were against the accord and they voted against it. It should never have been brought to a plebiscite because it was negotiated between the government and the belligerent forces that were recognized. In addition to the parties such as Cuba and Norway that were part of hosting these uh, uh, peace negotiations. No, it can be implemented immediately. I, that's what I would like to say. And I do think that yep. to, to make this peace accord real, it has to be made real immediately. Raul, uh, if I could add, yeah, go ahead. Yes, thank you. If I could add a comment to that, I think the reality on the ground, unfortunately, is very different. I think that what we're seeing is there are a number of dynamics that are forcing, you know, breakaway groups, and that will continue to lead to some of these armed groups to, to gain strength. One of them is Venezuela. The ELN is taking refuge there and getting re revenues out of Venezuela. The uh, breakaway groups from the F, uh, the the FARC 
will continue to control drug trafficking routes to Venezuela. So these illegal mining and uh, drug trafficking are enormous sources of income, yeah. and those are not going away. So some of these uh, you know, groups will continue to essentially flourish and, and strengthen. That, I think, is, a, is one of the more um, sort of difficult issues that a peace accord has to deal with, and right. unfortunately, that's Raul, an uncomfortable reality no one likes to discuss. Yeah, Raul, I'm sorry. Yeah. Go, go ahead, Gloria. Yes. Nobody is talking here about the violence of the paramilitaries that have killed almost a thousand people, more than 850 now, and the numbers aren't reducing. The, the, the claim by the Duque government against Venezuela is part of this month of aggression against Venezuela on behalf of the U.S. government against Venezuela, which is blockaded, suffering paramilitary attacks from the Colombia border. We saw on February 23rd yeah. with the humanitarian so-called aid that the Colombian government was allowing terrorists to fill up Molotov cocktails and throw them at those so-called aid trucks. It, yeah. The violence comes from the Colombian government. Okay, uh, Raul, I, just, I, 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 yeah, I want to get yeah, to, are, are crimes being committed on both sides? I, I, you know, I think we've seen a lot of that during the last 50 years of conflict. Obviously, you know, crimes have been committed from, from every possible side and every possible group that operates here. I think the important thing for us is to get a sense of what this will mean politically, the rise of the new FARC, if you will, what will it mean politically and security-wise. I think politically what it will mean is that you have a sort of center left and a sort of a far right left here that will have to sort of re revamp their sort of their approach to politics um, because obviously you now have a FARC that is very anti-investment and very anti-business in, in sort of the ways it is expressing itself. So what will that mean for the legitimacy of, you know, uh, center left individuals that yeah. are trying to become a viable force here? One. Two, yeah. on the security front, we don't think that this group will have yet the strength to actually uh, deteriorate um, security in places like Bogota or, or Medellin, but that does mean that these groups will become increasingly strong yeah. throughout the region and areas where the FARC used to operate. So from a security standpoint, it will be challenging. We don't think it is, you know, the end of the uh, of the accord or, yeah. or certainly the end of security as we know it in, in Colombia, but it does mean that this government has a lot of homework to do. All right. Lisa, there is another dimension to this, an international dimension. Many of those fighters who now want to resume the war are seeking refuge in neighboring Venezuela. Uh, there are reports that they're being rearmed by Venezuela as well, or there are accusations or allegations that they're being rearmed by Venezuela. Uh, this is what the Colombian president had to say about that. Let's watch this. Colombia, no acepta. Colombia doesn't accept any threats, not of any nature, least of all from drug traffickers. Colombians, let it be clear that we are not facing the birth of a new guerrilla movement. We are facing criminal threats from a gang of narco-terrorists who are being sheltered and supported by dictator Nicolas Maduro. Listening to the sentiments there, uh, tough words from the uh, Colombian president. How does this complicate the situation? Look, no, gov no government should help foment the Colombian conflict once again. However, the the responsibilities in Colombia, the responsibility is among Colombians and the Colombian government and the demobilized FARC leaders and base and Colombian society to make this deal work. Because if this peace deal doesn't work, peace is lost for another generation in Colombia. It's a tremendous advantage right now. 13,000 FARC leaders um, uh, demobilized, laid down their arms, the vast majority of them are still trying to make it work. So instead of casting around for blame, international community, the Colombian government really needs to help Colombia make this deal work, and not just for the combatants, not just for the armed forces, but Colombian people living in the conflict zones who have not had a moment's peace in so many years. Gloria, talking about make this work, uh, President Duque says that this deal, the deal that's currently uh, been uh, signed, it gives too much uh, to the FARC, including amnesty, and it also gives them positions in Congress as well. What does that tell us about his commitment to the current deal? 
I think that's the key. I think that President Duque, as I said before, when he was running for president, was making clear that he was not for the peace accord. He could use all kinds of reasons or excuses, but the peace accord was hammered out over years. And now he's saying that he's finding excuses and pretexts to throw it out completely. The FARC disarmed at the beginning of the implementation of the accords. They disarmed first before the other side of the accord, that is, of supplying the resources, of helping the former guerrillas return to civilian life, which has not been completed by any means, only a tiny percentage. So the responsibility lies on the Colombian government. I also wish to say that it's a complete lie that Venezuela is rearming or arming mm -hmm. any Colombians. The Venezuelan government is busy trying to defend itself against the threats from Colombia, the threats from Brazil, but primarily the threats from the United States. And if we look at the history of Colombia, the FARC did not exist for many years, or the ELN, until years after the violence began in 1948, state-sponsored violence. Every time since the beginning of the guerrilla movement for social justice, every time that there was an attempt at peace, and it's existed for many years, this attempt at peace, the U.S. has thwarted every attempt, has financed the government militarily. Right. Raul, does the Colombian government want to roll back some of the provisions in the peace deal, um, or do you think this peace deal could be renegotiated uh, to address some of these concerns? Yeah, I, I think renegotiation is, is, is put, the concept of renegotiation is pushing it. I mean, I think, uh, you know, it, it, the, the deal has been signed. What, what's there is there. Um, the issue this government is having is whether some of the components of this deal should remain uh, within the Constitution. Obviously, former President Uribe has been very vocal about that. Um, you know, a lot of people that support uh, peace in this country would disagree. Um, uh, you know, and, and certainly one of the biggest achievements of the peace accord has been demobilizing 10 plus thousand people uh, from what used to be the oldest and, and, and largest guerrilla group in, in the continent. So, um, so I don't think renegotiation is in the cards. I think what you will see is, is a, a, a um, peace accord that will continue to polarize both sides of society yeah. in, in this country for the foreseeable future. Michelle, you have reported extensively on this war and on the FARC, uh, and you talked about this a moment ago, but I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more. Uh, what can you tell us about their reintegration, um, government funding for underdeveloped rural areas from where many of these guerrillas come from, also restitution to the victims of this war? It's been a complicated process. Implementing ideally should be done uh, right away, as Gloria said, but it, in the reality, it has been very slow. And I think it has to do a lot as well with uh, logistical issues. I mean, we're talking about a country that for years uh, didn't have state presence in many regions. That's partly why we have such a, a difficult uh, situation with narco trafficking, with illegal mining. Obviously, corruption is a huge issue as well. But there are just regions that the state does not reach. And so we had uh, these demobilization camps um, uh, that were set up in order to uh, 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 make it easier and have everyone, uh, have all of the, of the FARC members demobilized, turn in their arms, start uh, productive projects. Um, and we did see the government come in with, uh, uh, slowly, and, and at times uh, many have criticized how slow it was to get uh, housing for them, to get uh, health uh, facilities, education in those regions. That uh, has been applauded by some as an effort that has helped in those regions for the citizens that live there. But at the same time, we're not seeing uh, a, a huge, huge, uh, we don't know if it's, if it's effort, but we're not seeing it uh, in those regions where the government is now all of a sudden uh, uh, bringing in a lot of uh, help to those people. And that is something key in order to see peace in those regions. Victims uh, continue to, to uh, uh, complain that they want to see uh, more reparations, uh, that, that this, the whole judicial uh, system uh, transitioning uh, system it has been slow to process. Uh, and there are all types of excuses in terms of money, in terms of uh, time. Uh, there are so many, hundreds of thousands of victims, uh, millions. And how do you get 
justice for every single one of them in just three years after six, more than 60 years of armed conflict of violence. Okay, Raul, go ahead. Sorry, if I could add a, a comment to that, thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. I think uh, you're absolutely right. I think one of the bigger concerns right now is that for many, many years, the government has been absent in very large parts of the country, yeah. and that is where the FARC became the law and became the institution. And now you have a void there, and the government hasn't been uh, active enough filling that void, both from a security span standpoint, from an education, health, et cetera. And that in itself can lead to generating, uh, you know, more strength for other groups and for some of these groups to continue to essentially do what the FARC used to do in those areas and to strengthen over time. Yeah, Lisa, I was going to say that this is a very volatile part of Latin America. You've got Venezuela there, you've got Colombia there. Do you see any kind of policy on the part of the United States government on how it will handle this, or is the policy just confined to regime change in Venezuela? The U.S. government is not focusing, as it should, on such a crucial issue, which is consolidating peace in Colombia. It is throw. It is uh, can be really throwing away this opportunity. Uh, to focus only on Venezuela makes no sense. 1.4 million Venezuelan refugees and migrants are in. Uh, Colombia right now and more are coming by the moment. The Colombian government and people are being very generous about that. But if peace, if peace is not consolidated in Colombia, the capacity to absorb um, uh, Venezuelan refugees and migrants will be, will be much, much harder. Uh, it is so short-sighted not to focus on this tremendous opportunity. The peace accords really tell the Colombian government to do what it should have always done, which is bring the civilian part of the state into neglected areas of the countryside and construct a more fair and modern economy. It will be good for everyone, for business, for surrounding governments, and above all, for Colombians living in those areas if peace is consolidated. And that's where we have to leave it. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Anand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.